My very first film appearance ended up on the cutting room floor. Uh, I, I think uh, it was in uh, a film called Contraband with Conrad Veidt. <gasps> How I fainted over him. And uh, Valerie Hobson and Michael Powell was directing it. And then something happened which only happens in romantic novels. You were discovered in a restaurant. Uh, I was um, taken to lunch at, at a restaurant and sitting at a nearby table was the one and only Gabriel Pascal who made Pygmalion and who made Caesar and Cleopatra and was about to make a film of George Bernard Shaw's Major Barbara. And um, he spotted me and came over and uh, said something bizarre like, Sweet Virgin, are you an actress? So I didn't know whether to be flattered at either or both or neither. <laughs> <laughs> well, to cut a long story short, I, I got the part of Jenny Hill and Major Barbara. And then after that you got parts in some very good wartime British pictures, Love on the Dole and Hatter's Castle. And yes. Colonel Blimp, which I remember yeah. you popped up in a number of different roles. Yes, oh, that was my favourite act. Uh, it was such a marvellous idea to play three different women. And uh, the, the reason they were played by the same person was that to Colonel Blimp's eye, the girl was exactly like the first girl he fell in love with. And, of course, nobody else could see it at all. Yeah. I thought it was an enchanting idea. That was another of Michael Powell's books. Yes, it was. And Emmerich Pressburg wrote. Yes. Mm. You'd been under contract to Gabriel Pascal, but you'd only made the one picture for him. Yes, that's right. I only ever did make the one picture. Oh, there was a lot of talk at one time that I might do. I think uh, Vivian Lee fell ill or something. And um, Pascal said, uh, do you not think, sweet virgin, he was still calling me a virgin, that you could lose 10 pounds <laughs> and, and play, <laughs> play Cleopatra? <laughs> but that, that came to naught because Vivian, rest her sweet soul, she did play it yes. very beautifully. MGM bought out Pascal's contract. That's right, they bought out his contract. What? So I, I really had not much choice of where, where I went in Hollywood because uh, I think Gabby had made a pretty good profit out of me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it was called The Hucksters with uh, Clark Gable. So that was fairly intimidating to go to Hollywood, A, and B, to do your first movie with the, the, with the king. Yes. And the king he was. And uh, How did you find him to work with? Adorable. He was an enchanting man who had absolutely no pretensions about himself, either as a person or an actor at all, and um, would make fun of himself and say, I was just born with this face and these ears that stick out and this voice, and uh, <laughs> women seem to be crazy about me, and here I am, you know. <laughs> MGM worked you very hard, didn't they? They did work me very hard, indeed. But uh, I, I was there, you know, at, at, at a wonderful time. Yes. There was one film you made which was fairly rough, tough and terrific for its day. That was From Here to Eternity. Yes, yes indeed. Well, that was what's known as the break point. Uh, I was tremendously lucky to get that part uh, because it did, it, it, what's known, it didn't break, it shattered the mold. Mm. And um, coming at the same time as, as the movie came out, uh, I went to Broadway and appeared in Robert Anderson's play, Tea and Sympathy, which was also, for its time, a, a shocker. I mean, it, it, it is a very tender and lovely play, but it had a very startling end that only, how, what is it, 20 years ago, if that, had uh, people gasping. They simply couldn't believe that a, you know, 35-year-old woman would offer herself to an 18-year-old boy. I mean, the roof fell in. And uh, today, I mean, it's the norm, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> They're doing it all over the place. <laughs> One big musical, The King and I, did you do all your own singing? No, uh, no, I did not. While I was on tour with Tea and Sympathy, I was taking singing lessons like mad. I had taken them before mm. when I was a drama student, but I, ah, I worked and worked and worked and worked. And I, I got my voice up and steadier in pitch. It was good for my theatre work as well, but not enough to be able to sing some of those very difficult songs. Because some of them are very difficult very, songs yes. in The King and I. They're very sustained. It's one thing on the stage to, to get away with not a very good voice because Gertrude Lawrence didn't have a very good voice, but it's quite another thing in the, in the cinema. You, it's got to be true. 
and um, this very, very talented girl, the singer uh, Marnie Nixon, she, she not only ha had this extraordinary ear that she could really mimic one's voice and one's pronunciation, but funnily enough, we, we looked extraordinarily alike. And uh, I, I, I think I've heard her having dubbed for other people, but I really do think that, uh, not because it was my film and I was in it, uh, but The King and I, it's, it's really very hard to tell when it isn't me. Yes, you did some of the songs. Yes, I did Whistle a Happy Tune, yes. And the intro to Getting to Know You. Which other films do you remember with affection? Oh, I've, I've been so lucky. I, I've done so many that I've, I've, I've adored doing and, and have so many happy memories of. I suppose um, The Sundowners, the story about the Australia and the, yes. the sheep farms with Bob Mitchum. Um, that's one of my real favourites. I remember that with great, great affection. Uh, a fair to remember, of course. I'm I, uh, ashamed to say I will even sit now and find myself crying <laughs> over it, which I think is pretty disgusting. <laughs> Night of the Iguana, uh, I, I love. The Innocents, I absolutely oh, yes, yes. adored doing. A wonderful story. Uh, it was a wonderful story, and I think Jack Clayton's interpretation of it was quite, quite brilliant, and it was desperately overlooked, I think. Yes.